Very nice. All right. Uh, we are going to get started. Uh, so welcome to another edition of Conversations with our Legend series. Uh, so we've gone uh, all over the place from Jesse Itzler to Kara Golden to Claude Silver and everywhere in between. And we are blessed to have a, a good friend of mine. Oh, we've got another person joining. Uh, Robert Hamilton Owens, who I always say the Dos Equis guy has nothing on my friend Robert. Um, he is an amazing, amazing human being for many, many reasons. Um, but I think, uh, you know, anybody uh, who wants to be inspired, I would encourage you, please, please, please pick up Robert's book. It's called Beyond Average. Uh, it is an incredible read uh, filled with his life stories, which are pretty epic. Um, hello, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we got people joining like crazy now. Um, so Robert, uh, Robert's one of these guys who's accomplished so much stuff that I had to write stuff down because there's just... Uh, there's no way to kind of give his resume easily, which I'm not even going to try to do. Um, but he is somebody that Triathlete Magazine called the most interesting triathlete in the world. Uh, our mutual friend, Joe DeSena, who started uh, Spartan Race, called uh, Robert the fittest and mentally toughest 66-year-old in the world, period. And coming from Joe, that is high praise indeed. Um, Robert has accomplished more in his life than maybe anybody I've ever met. Uh, and it just, it goes on and on. He was a part of our special forces. Uh, he was a United States Air Force pararescue man. Um, he has done, I think, 12 Ironman uh, competitions. Uh, we'll talk about your world marathon, I'm sure, which is insane. It's seven marathons in seven days on seven different continents. And if I had to even fly to seven different continents uh, in seven days, I think I'd be tired. But if I had to run a marathon every single time, I don't know how that's possible, but you did it uh, at 66. Um, he's done Kokora, which we can talk about. Um, but he's just an amazing guy. One of the funny stories that I, I remember from the book is when your mom thought you got kidnapped when you were four years old, Robert rode his tricycle to school at four years old. Um, and I guess his mom thought he got, he got abducted uh, only to find out hours later that he, was, he had just ridden his bike to school like any normal four-year-old would, would do. And what I don't know is how far it was to the school. It was uh, probably about six blocks. Too funny. Too and the funny. fun part so that... was I had my cowboy boots out and I had my guns on and I had my cowboy hat on. And so I was, I was ready and <laughs> ready for anything. And I wanted to go to my sister's classroom. So I just went in there and sat in the back of my sister's classroom and dangled my feet on the little chair. You know, they said, what are you doing here? I said, I just came to school. <laughs> and they thought, you know, they sent the police out. <laughs> police were all looking for me all over town. So, you know, we're excited. Tomorrow we launch uh, our third book, uh, Standing O, Salute. Uh, Robert is in it. Uh, Robert was in the original Standing O Encore. Um, so we're super blessed. All of the proceeds are going to Sean's organization, Special Operations Warrior Foundation, uh, so we're really excited. Tomorrow's a big day. Uh, so I appreciate uh, Robert once again stepping up as I knew he would and writing a, an inspiring chapter. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Robert in a minute. Uh, if people stop joining us here, because I have to admit every single one of these folks. Um, one of the things that, that I love that's in the beginning of your book, Robert, is this saying that you have that, what if I could pull this off? I need to be obsessed with being great 
there can be no doubt, I must be driven. And those words have gotten you to do some of the most incredible, insane things that I think one of them would be somebody's accomplishment for a lifetime, but you've just packed all of that into 69 remarkable years. So uh, anyway, I'm blessed to call you a friend and I'm blessed to have you have you on. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about whatever you want to talk about. And then I'm going to let these guys uh, pepper you with questions about how, how in the world you've done, done all this amazing stuff. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate that. Um, and hi to all of you. I don't think that I'm so amazing, nor, nor am I legendary, but if Scott does, that's okay with me. Um, you know, I think all of us have a story and all of us, have at least two people living in us, the person that we're living at the moment and the person that we dream about becoming or wish we could do. Uh, every time I watch Tom Brady, I go, God, I wish I could have a Tom Brady moment or I watch a Super Bowl, I think, wouldn't it be fun to be in a Super Bowl? I'm an average guy, you know, been average all my life, never really been accomplished, but you have these dreams inside of you. Like, uh, like I said, as David Goggins would say, what if? And most of my life, I've had these what ifs because I've, I've been surrounded by gifted people, real gifted people, and I was never like them. And I always thought, wonder if I could do that or wonder how they did that or, you know, should I even dream that kind of a dream? And fortunately for me, um, I had men take interest in me way back in junior high and high school, who said, hey, Owens, you know, you're, a, you're an interesting creature here, but there's some talent inside of you. And I remember my, my uh, I, I should back up, I'm an adopted kid and um, uh, my, my mom couldn't have any kids. And so she went, they went down to an orphanage here by the hospital in Orange, California, and they picked out a girl and then four years later, they said, we'll have a boy. So we went down and got a boy. And back then it was like supermarket sweep. The bassinets were just lined up and they'd pull up the screen and you could have as many kids as you wanted. And that was at the end of the Korean War. And so they went down and got a girl. Then they went down and got a boy. And what was nice about my mom and dad uh, was that I was a special needs kid. I had bad legs, bad feet. And so I wore corrective shoes and corrective boots and couldn't run by and large till about sixth grade. So all through elementary school, I sat on the sidelines and watched kids play. And I wanted to play. And they said, go play tetherball, you know, hit the ball around the stick thing. And um, I didn't like that. It was a case of rejection of what's wrong with me. And um, I began to build up issues in my life. Like I remember in third grade, the kid down the street who I grew up with, and parents are close, you know, one day in the middle of the street, he just said to me, hey, Bobby, do you know that you're a mistake? And I went, I'm not a mistake. He goes, yeah, you're a mistake. Your parents didn't want you. And I remember going, I'm not a mistake. And he said, yeah, you are. And so I went home and I went home to my mom and I said, hey, mom, am I a mistake? And she said, who told you a mistake? I said, Terry, <laughs> my best friend down the street, our parents, you know, are best friends, meaning that his parents said something to Terry. And so my mom got really upset. She was a UCLA grad and PE and went to, went to a, uh, got her master's. Anyway, she, she said, go back and tell Terry, your parents chose you. His parents got stuck with him. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back down the street. I said, hey, Terry, where are you? You know, And he's, hi, right, what are you doing? We're throwing rocks or something, you know? And, I said, you know what? I'm not a mistake. My parents chose me, but your parents got stuck with you. And now they're really stuck. And he goes, uh-huh. I go, uh-huh. Go tell them that. And he turned around and went home. <laughs> and I went home and told my mom. I told him, she goes, good. And, but the, that thing stuck inside me. Am I a mistake? I got these special needs issues. Or am I wanted? Um, and it just sort of tweaked my melon. You know, like, Wow, I wonder what's wrong with me. Then my mom got lupus in sixth grade and I went from straight A's to straight F's, started going to the principal's office every day for getting in trouble. And um, I was just, I was um, 
not handling my stuff well. And then I had a man, uh, an eighth grade history teacher, say to me, you know, you're not a bad kid, you're just screwed up. And I said, yeah, okay. And he began to invest time in me. He said, you know, if you'll do your grades and do your homework, I'll take you snow skiing with me. He was a snow skiing instructor in the local mountains. And he told my parents, I'll try to get Bobby on track because I was getting D's and S. And um, he began to just mentor me and I'd go with his wife and kids. We'd go skiing every weekend because I made sure to get my homework done. So I'd go skiing all the time. And that sort of carried me with issues of poor self-worth. Um, who am I? Where do I fit? My dad's a Phi Beta Kappa out of Stanford and he's the presiding judge of the county. My mom's a 4.0 out of UCLA. My sister's a 4.0 out of USC. And I don't like school. Plus I don't get along well in school. And I, I drifted. At the same time, I got sexually assaulted twice by eighth grade. One time at Boy Scout camp, uh, some older boys in an older boy tent, and then another experience. And I remember that I just didn't know how to process how to be screwed up. And so as it turned out, I began to drink a lot. And I drank starting in ninth grade every weekend or every time I could until I got to high school, which is a three-year high school. And in three-year high school, this kid came up and said, because uh, my parents lived at the beach and I spent every weekend at the beach surfing or skimboarding or boogie boarding or something, you know. And we lived inland in Anaheim by Disneyland. And um, this kid said, hey, you gotta come out for swimming and water polo. And I did, and I found my niche. I found that when I was in the water, I was, I was okay. And this coach, who was a Hungarian Olympian from the 1956 Hungarian Olympian team, which was interesting because that's when the revolt came in Budapest and the Russians took over Hungary. And the word came to all the Olympians in Australia that if you get on the boat and go back to Hungary, you're all gonna be arrested for being student activists. And so all these water polo swimmers and other athletes, as soon as the boat pulled out of Sydney Harbor after the 56 Olympics, they all jumped off the boat and swam back to Sydney and asked for asylum. And he made his way to the United States not being able to speak much English. Somehow he ended up at our high school and um, ultimately, he went from our high school, creating a bunch of All-Americans and Olympians out of our high school to Cal State uh, Long Beach, and from Cal State Long Beach to the University of Michigan, and from University of Michigan to becoming the U.S. Olympic coach. And so I, you know, I, I get in this little high school swim program with a guy that's a, a kick-butt Olympian, and he said to me, hey, Owens, you know, you're not any good, but you got talent. If you'll work hard, you can beat better talent. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. Um, if you'll just focus and learn to focus and stay on track, track, there's these guys that are gifted, these age group swimmers starting swimming at six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. They're good, but you can do stuff if you'll focus. And I grabbed onto that. Um, at that time, um, my father never came to one of my sporting events in high school because that was the greatest generation and he was busy building a new, new America, but my mom came all the time. And so this coach became a father figure and the assistant coach. And for the next three years, they just kicked my butt. But they said to me, look how you're progressing. If you'll stay on track and if you focus, um, sky's the limit for you. You've got buried talent inside you. My head said I was a loser, but they said, um, you can do this. At that same time, I became a beach lifeguard. And the interesting thing was you had to be hired at 16 to be a beach lifeguard. I was 15 and a half my sophomore year. And in Southern California, if you're a water polo swimmer guy, most of them go to some city and try to be a beach lifeguard. You get to surf before and after work and look at girls during the day and get paid for it. So it was a great <laughs> summer job for water guys. And um, I said to the guys on my high school water polo team, I'd like to be a lifeguard when I get to be 16, which wouldn't be to my junior summer. And I said, but I'd like to just go down and check it out and try it out. So my coach said to me again, crash the system, <laughs> go do your deal. And so I began to go down after school at 15 and a half and scout out the tides, the surf, the rip, how to body surf this, this course that I was going to have to do. And so on that morning when about 75 kids showed up to be tryouts or trying out for the, the uh, San Clemente lifeguard department. 
there was UCLA guys and UCI guys, Long Beach State guys, and then high school swimmers. Um, I went down there and un, unbelievably, I got two first and a third out of three events. And I beat all the other guys because I body surfed past all the better swimmers. And I learned how to take off on waves and, and just position myself with the tides and the currents. And what happened was they said, okay, we want to talk to you. Who are you? And they took me inside and the chief and the captain said, what's the deal with you? Where'd you come from? I said, I came down here for two months and practiced this course because I want to see next year when I turn 16, if I could try out and be a lifeguard. And they said, that's a, that's an interesting deal. Go home. And on that next Thursday, they called me up and they said, hey, how would you like to be a lifeguard at 15 and a half? And I said, the city charter says I can't be a lifeguard. I'm underage. And they said, yeah, but we went to the city and got a waiver for you, insurance waiver. We're going to hire you at 15 and a half. You're hot. And I went, whoa. And our high school team went nuts. And the coaches went nuts. And they said, see how you game the system? See how you did it? See how you press through what people would tell you to do? My dad said, what are you doing? Just play by the rules and show up next year. My mom said, go for it. You know, anything you want to do, you can do. Just try it. And that sort of got inside of me that if I could focus, you know, if I really wanted to date a girl, I'd work really hard at it. <laughs> if I really wanted to make money, I'd do whatever it took to make money. But if I didn't have complete interest, I'd find excuses not to do things. And that kind of DNA in my life sort of put this thing inside me. Which of you want to, you want to be the excuse guy with your issues and you're drinking, trying to cover up your dysfunction, or do you want to focus and then all of a sudden do these things? And I chose to try to find an identity in doing things that people told me I'm unable to do. And so when it came time for some of these beach lifeguards to become pararescue men, there were pararescue men. In those days, the Navy SEALs would come by and try to recruit beach lifeguards. We need water guys. And then the They'd say, watch out, because the Air Force guys are going to come in next week and it recruit you also. And so we had guys on the lifeguard department that became Navy SEALs and guys became PJs, pararescue. And these guys in this reserve unit in Riverside, California said, hey, Orange, you need to be a pararescue. And I said, um, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think I got the goods for special ops. And they said, again, if you do what we say, if you lock down, no drinking, no drugs, no chicks, no social life, if you'll just focus and train, you can do this. And I didn't have faith in me. I had faith in their faith in me. And they gave me a plan and they said, do this. And then weekly, how is your training, Robert? What are you doing? Are you doing what we told you to do? You're not working hard enough. And for six months, I just shut down and um, I, did, I enlisted. And when I enlisted, there was 150 of us in my class, our class. And at the end of about a year and a half, two years, there were seven of us left standing. And um, I became one of the seven. And then they made me team leader over all those guys. Actually, we had 16 because we had rollbacks from other classes who had been hurt that added to our class. But here I was again thinking, where are all the good guys? We're all the smart guys. And the seven of us who were left said, this is crazy. Why are we here? But the good guys hadn't trained mentally and hadn't prepared themselves for pain. And therefore, they all quit somewhere in the first eight weeks or in the pipeline. And somehow, we made it. And again, that voice in my head said, you know, you can do this. You just need to focus. You just need to learn how to do one thing and do it right. And the key is you have to say no to so many things so that you can say yes to one thing. And that focus, that, that time, and, and, and probably the truth for all of us, you that have businesses and families and things is that when you choose to do an extraordinary thing or something that's over the top, you cannot live a balanced life for a period of time. You have to live an unbalanced life of focus which can cause great problems if you're married because that's selfishness and narcissism and, and all those things. It's all about me and your whole world is to support me. And that's a dangerous thing. But when you're single, you can get away with that. And so 
you live an unbalanced life for six months or so, and then you can go back and live a balanced life after you've achieved what it is that you're trying to achieve. And um, whether it's lose weight or learning a language or an instrument or start a business. And so anyway, my life story is I'm just an average guy who had people speak into my life and say, you can do this, or you should try doing this, or why don't you do this? Or as we say, in your, my head, what if? What if I could pull this off when everybody else says, don't try? And I, for some reason, with my personality like, type, likes that kind of a challenge that says, um, go against the grain. Uh, put all your chips on yourself, move them to the center of the table and say, you know, if I'm going to bank on anything, I'm going to bank on me. If I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down banking on me versus somebody else trying to help me do it. And I can be an employee and I've learned how to be an employee, but also I like being the employer. I like the guy in the lead creating my own future versus having someone create my future for me because they'll always create it too small. They'll always make it uh, what they think in their lifestyle versus what I can do with my lifestyle. So that was sort of that. And I've, um, I've done that. When I, when I left the military, I left the military because they said we're having budget cuts after Vietnam and we need a bunch of you to get out. So you have three months to figure out if you're gonna get out or not. And I, I chose to take the, the GI Bill and get out. And I was bored. Um, I went back to college on the GI Bill. I was just bored stiff. And so I read this book and the book was, how would you like to smuggle in the Soviet Union? <laughs> and I thought, what if? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a trip? That'd be a rush. And so I wrote the author of the book and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to join with you guys. <clears throat> Anyways, it turns out I meet the national director and he says to me, what, what's your deal? I said, I'm a board special ops guy. What, I mean, I'm out of college. I mean, going to school again is boring. I'll do my stuff, but I need to get on the edge. And he said, great. And so I don't talk about this much, but um, back in the 70s, there was a motorhome factory in Denver that when you go to this motorhome factory, um, it looks pretty normal until they go and the back doors, you know, that are 30 feet high go and they open up and there's a whole nother set of motorhomes in the back and they go, the gates go and you're in this thing. And all these motorhomes were built for smuggling in the Soviet Union. And I went, this is hot. And they showed me how the walls moved and the floors moved and everything was, and they said, we want you to take this motorhome, drive it to the port of Houston, put it on a boat, get it to Amsterdam, pick it up in Amsterdam, deliver it to this location. There you'll meet your team and you can start your, your smuggling career. And I went, bada bing. <laughs> this, and I told my parents, I was just going to Europe, you know, go skiing. But got over there and started making these smuggling trips in and out of the Soviet Union. And that was during the Carter administration. And it was a Helsinki peace accords because the Russians were putting uh, warheads on the SS-22 missiles in secret cities. And we had to get, we, we got Christian literature in and we smuggled political, political documents out. And we made these runs for two to three weeks inside Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, delivering stuff, picking up stuff. And I did that while I was in college because it was really fun. Anyway, anyway, when that got was done, I, I was in college my senior year, still sort of bored. And I read the Sports Illustrated article and it was this thing about the stupidest, wildest, event in the world that was going to be called an Iron Man. <laughs> and I went, I read this thing about these people that showed up and you guys all would enjoy it. It's the 1979 May 18th edition. You can pull it up online. Uh, talking about this race that Why World of Sports had heard about was going to go over and film for year number three. Anyway, when I read it, I said, I can do that. <laughs> what if I could pull that off? And so, um, I said to my fiance, oh, you want to go to Hawaii for honeymoon? <laughs> she goes, yeah, what? I said, there's this thing. I want to figure out how to get sponsored and go over there. Anyway, went over and did Iron Man year three when there was only a hundred of us and we were still drinking beers and people were showing up in costumes. And we, I, I borrowed a bicycle, showed my swim trunks <laughs> and um, no helmet, you know, no toe clips or anything. Just go knock yourself out. The reason that the Iron Man is 112 miles is that's the, 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 the loop course around Honolulu and the island. 
So when you get to Honolulu and you, you bicycle around the island, that road is 112 miles. That's why the Ironman today is 112 miles. Anyway, did that and um, continued to then, I got married and had five kids and shut down most things where I just want to spend time being a good dad, did local endurance things, but always had this itch inside me. Like I like middle-class suburbia, five kids, you know, a minivan here and suburbans here and soccer and football and gymnastics and all the kids things. But I always thought, I wonder, wonder if I could stay in the game some more. And at 50, my, my punk youngest son said to me, Hey dad, you're really old. I mean, like that, you're half a century, like you're 50. I mean, like, what's it like being 50? And I didn't like the way he said it. And I did, didn't like him at the moment. And so I said, really? And that's when I thought, well, let's make an Ironman comeback. And so um, at 50 in the year 2000, I said, I'm going to see if I can pull this thing off. So I got up early in the morning and then got the kids to school and then worked out in the middle of the day and did this and that and went back and started doing Ironmans and had done 11 since I turned 50. And the experiment is for all of us, um, can I just be in good enough shape to be healthy? And so I don't feel like I'm a triathlete. I feel like I'm a guy that can swim, bike and run one day a year. And I just put it together. And so that's my thing now in my 60s is um, I speak a lot on you choose how you age and on um, life goals and what you want to do and what your excuses and stuff. And my, my experiment primarily now is I want to see if I could be in as good a shape as I was in my 20s. And I, I want to see if I had to go out frail, meaning when I do an Ironman, we are an age group. So it's 40 to 45 and 46 to 50. And on your right calf, they put a letter and that gives your age group. On your left calf is your number. So right now I'm 65 to 70, which means I wear a J on my calf. Next year I get to be a K. <laughs> and you don't see a lot of J's out there and you don't see a lot of K's. And <laughs> when you're riding a bike, you, you look at the, the guy that's passing you up and you look at their leg to see how old they are. Because <laughs> you can see, are you A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K? And you don't see a lot of the old guys. I'd go up to guys that were 65 to 70 and 70 to 75 and say, how are you doing? Nice to see you here. I'm Robert, you know, I'm, a, I'm a J, I'm 65. And there's not a bunch of us out there. And so over and over, they'd say to me, you know, I can swim. I just can't pull the water the way I used to. And I can bike, but I can't push the pedal the way I used to. And I can run, but I'm just not that fast. And I'd look at their bodies and their bodies were changing like senior citizen change. And I didn't like that change. I didn't like seeing your muscles become flabby and lose the tensile strength. And so I thought, do I have to go out weak and frail? And there was a, there was a sister, her name is Lady, uh, Sister Madonna out of Iowa. And she's worldwide known because this nun does these Ironmans. And she did not, she's like done 20 Ironmans. And she could not finish between 75 and 77. She could not finish these Ironmans. She just wasn't in the game anymore. And it really discouraged her. So she went out and hired a personal trainer. <laughs> she said at 80 years old, I'm back in the game. So she hired this guy to train her. And then at 80, she went back and finished her Ironman. And you have to do an Ironman in 17 hours. And she did it in 15 and a half. She dropped an hour and a half time because she hired a trainer at 80 years old. And I went, oh, that's the deal right there. If you get a, you get a coach, and you get a trainer, you get a program as a senior citizen, as a senior athlete, you, there's still more potential in us than we have any idea. And what we do in the special ops teams, because I train Navy SEAL candidates and Air Force Special Warfare candidates, we tell them there is something called the 20X principle. And the 20X principle is there's 20 times more potential in you than you've ever allowed someone to bring out of you, meaning most of us can't bring it out of ourselves alone. We need someone to coach us, train us, mentor us, and take us through the pain zones, the mental pain, the emotional pain, the physical pain, take us into those realms that are hard for us to get to on our own. And so 
we tell kids, you can do this, but we're going to take you into being miserable, as the book would say, discomforting, miserable. I then go get trained. I say, okay, I'm going to make a comeback at 66, and I'm going to do five events where I've been told it's impossible. Don't show up. Don't do them. You're too old. What, what the hell? What's wrong with you? Why would you want to do this? And I said, what if, if, I wonder if as a senior, I can age gracefully and be stronger and not have to act like I'm old or have excuses about being old. So I went to a three-year training program at a place called Seal Fit with Mark Devine, which is a friend of Joe DeSantis out here in, in um, San Diego. And I said to them, I want to see if I can be an aerobic athlete, like long distance, don't raise your heart a whole lot. But I also want to see if I could be an anaerobic CrossFit games type guy, wall balls, box jumps, stairs, hills, run, spike your heart over and over again. Cause most athletes are either one or the other, you know, in the Olympics, you're either a distance runner or you're a sprinter, but you're not both. And the only community that really is both anaerobic and aerobic on a professional basis is special ops military. You got to be in the game quick, got to get that adrenaline rush, be in the firefight, but then you have to go for days sometimes. And so you have to have aerobic capacity, endurance, but you also have to be in the game quick when your heart rushes and your all those things happen. So I went to this training and um, I wanted to do this experiment. And it turned out to be an interesting experiment as Scott would probably say. And so we designed five things. The first one was, um, you all remember Benghazi? And that was uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's debacle with the ambassador. We lost four uh, Navy SEAL contractors protecting the ambassador in the movie 13 Hours. And so we wanted to raise money for those guys' families. They left wives and kids behind. And in the military, a lot of guys get, their families get left behind when they die. And so we wanted to raise money. So we did the, the 300 of Sparta, which is the movie 300. We wanted to go from Sparta to Thermopylae. It's a legend of 238 miles in eight days is what King Leonidas did. And so we wanted to see if we could go 30 miles a day, eight days from uh, the seas or oceans up to ski resorts, down to the water, up and down Greece, 238 miles in eight days and raise money for these guys. And um, we accomplished it. But I, but I was the oldest guy. <laughs> and they said, I remember when I showed up, this Navy SEAL said to me in Greece, he said, what the hell are you doing here? I just looked at him like, what the hell are you doing here? Anyway, anyway, he got humbled pretty quick, as did I. But we all made 30 miles a day for eight days. And it was a wild, stupid thing to do. Number two, there's a lifeguard thing down here where you run from San Clemente to Newport Beach. And it's a memorial run. And the memorial run is for the lifeguards who have died rescuing people in the ocean. So we have a number of guards here that, that died. And so we run, it's a run, swim, run, you run on the sand till you can't run anymore. We run, swim, run 26 miles in the sand. Um, and again, I was the oldest guy to ever attempt it and finish it by about 25 years. And again, I showed up and they said, what are you doing here? They thought I was a parent of one of the kids competing. <laughs> and they go, no, you can't be in the picture. The parents are supposed to stand over there. And I went, no, no, I'm doing it. And they, you're what? <laughs> all, all these 16 year olds and 18 year olds and I said okay here we go and boom you're golfing and it was a long day and then the third one um, was this Kokoro and that's a Navy SEAL Hell Week uh, experience and what happens is if you're in BUDS um, and you're in Hell Week the psychological breaking point when you do that it starts Sunday night at five o'clock when the, the gun goes off fireworks and the war zone starts and then you have to go to friday at five and the psychological breaking point for most young men is about 50 hours about wednesday night if you can go non-stop in and out of the ocean cold freezing no food if you can do 50 straight hours odds are you'll make it from wednesday to friday but most guys collapse implode psychologically not just physically but psychologically by the 50 hour mark and so there's a Navy SEAL event that's 50 hours nonstop. And that was the anaerobic one because you run up and down hills. Um, you do all kinds of heavy weighted rucks. You're in and out of the ocean at night, like six hours 
uh, in the Pacific, in and out in the sand, doing lunges and squats, bear crawls, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, was able to do that and became the oldest guy to ever show up and to ever accomplish that. And uh, it, again, if I'd known what I was getting myself into, I probably would never have done it. It was just nuts. It was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Three weeks later, I did my 12th Ironman. And then six weeks later, um, I did World Marathon Challenge, which was seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. And once you're in shape like that, you might as well just go for broke. <laughs> and see, so you, you just stack them up because you may never come back this way again. <laughs> and so that's a wild thing where you do Antarctica at 20 below zero uh, in January. And then you get on a plane and fly to Cape Town. It's 90 degrees above in Cape Town when you land. And you have to do two marathons in the first 17 hours. And so that's a trip to, to stack them up like that. And then you do from there, you go to Perth, Australia, and you get off the plane. Whenever you land, you just start running day or night. And you, you do that. There's four night ones in a row. You do Perth all night by yourself. You run in the dark, dark. And do I, which was interesting. And then you fly to Lisbon, which is winter time for them. You're running on cobblestones in the rain. It's cold. So you do Lisbon at night. And then you get on a long flight to Cartagena, Colombia. And you go back to the tropics and it's 90 degrees and humid. You knock that out. But from there, you go to Miami and you do the last two in the last 15 hours. So you do Cartagena, you get done at midnight. You're on a plane by seven in the morning. You're in Miami by nine. You're running by 10. And you do another one without any sleep at all. And so those were interesting things to see if mentally you could prepare yourself for that kind of strain and in your 60s. And I say that for all of you, not because I'm trying to tout the stuff that I've done, but to, to share with people that we can do more than we think. It's, around, it's about the people we hang with. It's the training and the research we do in advance. And if you have a strong enough why, you can do lots of things. But most of us don't have the why that so focuses on something that you break through these zones in your mind where you go to you go into places that you just didn't know you could do. And so I say that to all of you because whether you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, if you're not careful, you'll hang around mediocre-minded people who will tell you all the time why you can't, couldn't, shouldn't. And you'll, you'll begin to hear that and fall into that trap of middle age or whatever it is, and you'll back off your dreams. And I think that all of us have dreams and all of us have what ifs inside of us. And I think that if we can get the snakes out of our head, which took me a long time, I stopped drinking at 21, at 20, I stopped drinking. I didn't drink for probably until I was 45, didn't have a glass of wine or anything. I had to get, I had to deal with my issues because my issues were dealing with me. And if we don't deal with our stuff, our stuff deals with us in one way or another. And um, my, my story is I'm an average guy that worked on my issues, dealt with some of them, worked on, on changing, learning how to focus, and then choosing goals in life or with kids that were capturing of me. I needed something to capture me versus drifting. I found that when I didn't have goals, I drifted and I could easily get in trouble. But if I was focused on life or this or raising these five kids or doing whatever it was, um, I could stay focused and in the game. And the game that I created, the game that I wanted to live. And I wanted to live the life I wanted versus the life that just came out. So um, it's been an interesting existence. Uh, interesting, I did not make my last Ironman. I, I did 12 in a row, then my 13th, I just had been feeling weak. And I, I um, got out the bike course and hit this headwind for 30 miles and it just drained me. Anyway, I didn't make it. I went home, back to my CrossFit, said to the guy, I'm going backwards in my workouts. I don't know exactly why. And I had a heart attack. And uh, I thought, that's an interesting thing. I'm in bed and I'm thinking, I'm having a heart attack. Sweet, this is gonna be another adventure. And so I went and got some stents, put in my heart and uh, got out, got back in shape again, did my first half marathon just to see if my motor would work, you know, and then I got COVID. And when I got COVID, 
uh, that really threw me for a loop. That was in February this year. And um, it was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't scary. It wasn't like um, I was going to die, but it was a wild bronco of, of spiking 104 fevers every six hours for seven days where you wake up at 98.6 and then just sit on the couch and watch your thing go up and you get to 104 and you're just, whoa, and you get the bathtub full of cold water and break that thing, go back to sleep, get out of bed, wake up at 98.6 and ride that thing again for seven days. And my symptoms lasted till about the 17th day. And presently I'm, I'm working with a pulmonologist because my lungs are not the same. Uh, I feel like I have a corset around my, my chest. I just, I can, I can aerobic run, but I can't um, wall balls, box jumps, stairs. Uh, my anaerobic capacity seems limited. And it felt like, it has felt like, if I wonder what emphysema feels like, or would be like, that's what it sort of feels like, like there's cotton candy inside my lungs and I just can't open them up the way I used to, stamina wise. So I'm in this rehab thing now of, okay, who am I now? And is this a permanent damage or is this gonna heal itself? People say, what's your next adventure? What are you gonna do? Um, don't know, but it'll probably be an aerobic thing more than an anaerobic thing till I can get my aerobic or anaerobic capacity back, if ever. So. You know, life has a way of throwing stuff at you. You just have, you know, in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, me approaching 70, you just have to roll with the punches and flex. But my, my mantra is I don't have problems in life. I only have opportunities and challenges. Uh, problems are negative. Uh, opportunities and challenges are positive. And so the heart attack was a positive experience. And COVID is turning into a positive experience. I'm going to find a way to win and work through it and go on to the next level and and press through it whatever capacity I have. So that's that's sort of where I'm at. It's been fun. And um, I don't know what else I should say, except for it's nice to have you all here. And um, you all have your story, and I'd love to hear yours as well. Anyway, I know thanks. people uh, are dying to ask questions. Uh, yeah, it's I don't know what you say after listening to that, other than, you know, I am a slacker. Uh, <laughs> and I think we all have to admit, I don't care what we're doing. We're slackers uh, and you are a huge inspiration. So uh, take yourself off mute. Ask Robert whatever you want to know uh, about his amazing life and how he's uh, turned everything into an uh, incredible opportunity for himself. Hey, Robert, uh, my name is Mayan and I just first want to thank you so much for sharing your story um, and, and really just being open with like all of the different parts of your story. Uh, I find it really fascinating. I'm curious, when you're going into these, these big events and you're at some point hitting the, the hardest part, physically, mentally, is that when you were kind of implementing the, the mental strength or before you even started the event, had you already developed this mentality that carried you through those parts? You know, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. Um, people talk about hitting the wall. The wall is, is really not a wall. The wall is a moment. If you haven't practiced hitting the wall, you'll think it's a deal breaker. And what you do is you hire a coach who takes you to failure over and over and over. So many Olympians, Tour de France, Ironman guys, what happens is they have known their own personal limits where they, they go and that, that moment happens when you're overwhelmed emotionally, you're overwhelmed physically, you go, oh. I, I mean, like our, our US Olympic marathoner in London sat down on the side of the road in the, in the marathon on the sidewalk, he gave up like mile 23. And people said, his microphone, what happened? I don't know what happened. Well, you're our, our Olympic hopeful, you just crashed and burned, you sat out and didn't get up. He hit something that he'd never hit before. And what you want to practice and what we do with our special ops military guys is we take them to failure. We take them to their broken. And we say, look at our eyes, breathe. And we teach mindfulness, meditation. We teach how to break through panic and anxiety, whether it's in a firefight or in life, by deep nasal breathing, which the, the practice is, 
that we have a negative dialogue running in our brain. And it says, you're stupid, you shouldn't be doing this. This is hard, why are you here? Go ahead and quit, everybody else is quitting. And that dialogue, you know, get divorced, I can't stand my job, whatever it is, is there and you have to break that dialogue, that neuroplasticity, you can rewire your brain. So we practice going to that place where those thoughts come. Then we do deep nasal breathing, which is, and when your body is screaming for breaths and you don't do it, you can't think of anything but how much you want more air than you're giving yourself. And when you're thinking those, you know, most people pant. <laughs> well, we say animals pant. Mammals don't have to pant. We're in control of our breathing. Dogs aren't. So you can control your breathing, which controls your heart rate and your emotions and your, your fight and flight risk. So we teach them to... And when you think about that, that breaks the negative dialogue in your head because you can't think two things at the same time. You either think about your breathing or I'll screw it up if you. And so we say breathe and we break that dialogue in our head, which allows our minds to reboot. And it only takes five to 10 to 15 seconds to stop that negative dialogue and say, this is a wall. I can do this wall. I've been here before. Then your mind reboots, you go back into your training and you start again. And so we train guys, we're, we're gonna take you to places where the panic is supposed to come, but we're gonna teach you how to get through and think through that panic and continue and it works. And so in the old days, you just have guys that were just toughing it through, you know, just, just you just gotta tough yourself through. Now we can teach techniques to young people how to not listen to that negative dialogue, which we all have, raising kids, finances, pressure, job. I, need, I just need to settle down, rethink, reboot my mind. And I do it, you can do it all day long in natural life, or you can do it in your sporting event. So yes, you hit a wall, but if you practice over and over hitting that wall, rebooting, thinking it through, you'll find that you can then learn to make that pain your friend. I know you, I've felt you before, I've wrestled with you before, and I've learned how to win over these emotions or these thoughts before too. And you can do that so that to the point on the breathing, when I did the seven marathons in seven days on seven continents, I breathed all seven marathons with my mouth closed. So I didn't like that. I had trained myself to became natural where I was in control of my metabolism. You go into a Zen place, you block everything out, you focus on your breathing and life goes on versus this is really hard, but it takes a lot of practice. So that's a great question. If you go to seal fit with Mark divine, you, go to box breathing or emotional control on YouTube. He's got a lot of videos on this topic. And he also has some stuff called uh, unbeatable mind, how to have an unbeatable mind. And that's what we train our special ops kids on how to have an unbeatable mind because they're going to be in panic situations where we need them to think and not be immature, to be emotionally mature, not emotionally immature. And that's what you guys all do when you're when, when stuff's going crazy, they're all looking on you or someone they're saying, what do we do? And you want to be the one that goes, we can do this. Let's reboot. And you become the leader of your company or your family or your neighborhood or whatever. We can do this. I'm emotionally mature because I've worked on my stuff. Don't panic. We'll find a way to win. And you learn to, to be the leader that you want to be by learning how to control when those moments come that want to rock your world. Wow, thank you, thank you so much. That was in, invaluable. What did, you, what did you hear me say? Who's next? I heard you say that. Oh, oh go ahead. Oh. oh, I was gonna say, you know, what I really got out of that was the practice and the preparation for the moments that are the ones that really are the most impactful um, in our situations is so critical and that you know, if we don't practice and prepare before they come, then we're not going to be in control. That's great. And all of us have to practice in different ways. Who's next? Thanks for asking. Just take it.
take yourself off mute and fire away. Hey, Robert, this is Sean. I, um, fantastic discussion. Um, one of the things that you said that caught my attention was uh, one of many, uh, live an unbalanced life, focus, and then return back to a balanced life. And it, to some extent, maybe there's an analogy with deploying um, six months, a year at a time, and then coming back to the family. How much of this was a, a team effort with you and your family going from being extremely focused and then going back to more of a, what you described as a balanced life and, and with five uh, children, which that's amazing to me uh, all by itself. Uh, is, it, is it a team sport? You know, um, you'll learn through um, <laughs> pain that you need to get sight off from your family before you go unbalanced. So if you, if you choose to go unbalanced and, and just tell your wife, oh, by the way, I'm unbalanced and she didn't get any input, you could probably get divorced. And so, you know, in my thirties, I wasn't very wise. <laughs> I'm gonna do this and they go, what are you gonna do? And then I'd be unbalanced. They go, where'd dad go? And then I'd get the, the pushback and I'd say, I didn't handle that probably really good. I, I could use some more grace and wisdom on how I present these things that I wanna do. Over the years, um, part of the cost is of, of choosing, you know, first you first research what you're gonna do and then you get a strategy. Part of that strategy is getting sign off from those significant people in your life who will back you during that three month, six month, eight month thing that they say, I'm with you versus struggling on the outside. They come home to a struggle on the inside because they resent your unbalancedness and what it's costing them. And so I'd go to my kids and I'd say, you know, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Um, what do you guys think? Or then I go to my wife first and I'd say, honey, this is what my thought is, but this is what, how, why I want to do it and how I think it's going to work. And fortunately with time, you know, every tribe, every family has a culture and they get used to each other. And so I would try to model for my kids. What is it that you need to be unbalanced about for a while so that you can be excellent? And I'd say to my wife, what do you need to be unbalanced about for a while so that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish? Let's all set goals and accomplish things and we'll support each other in the things that we want to do that seem um, a bit unbalanced for whatever purpose. And, you know, when I got in my 50s, we pretty much had peace. 30 to 50 had some, some tough moments like, what's the deal, dad? You know? <laughs> and, um, one of the things I did was I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't raise American kids I wanted to raise world kids. So I spoke a lot around the world. I, I've spoken in probably 30 nations as a business consultant and I was a pastor. And so I would do free enterprise, um, entrepreneurship, like 10 trips to Russia and 12 trips to Beijing and you know, 15 trips to South Africa. And I'd speak all over the world. And I get to say to each of my kids, which trip do you wanna go this year with me? And they would get to pick a trip because I wanted to raise world kids that saw cultures so that they could, they could, if something happened in America, they could go live in any country and feel at home because this was a nice place to be raised, but we are survivors and we will, New Zealand's great, uh, Germany's great, Brazil's okay, uh, Hong Kong's a great place to go. So most of my kids went to 20 nations with me. Each trip, I try to take a kid with me so that I would never travel alone, but my eight, nine, 10, 12, 14, 15 years old, my kids would go with me and they'd experience what I was doing. My, my, my second daughter graduated from high school in Johannesburg on her laptop doing um, online high school. And so we'd go see elephants and lions and tigers and I'd speak and then I'd put her in the business lounge at the hotel and say, you have four hours now to get your homework done. And she'd get online and do all of her homework. She'd get up the thing and we'd go travel and we'd see things. And so, I tried to make it a win for my kids that I'm going to be unbalanced, but I want you in there with me. And I want you to then tell me what you want to do, volleyball, tennis, skiing, singing. Tell me what you really want to focus on. And we'll work on helping you do what you need to do, even if we have to be a balance for you. And it became a pretty nice environment where we, we encourage each other to do whatever we were wired by our personalities to do. But yeah, you gotta get you gotta get sign off. Otherwise, there's a, there's internal war. Amazing. 
Hey, Robert, uh, Lauren here. Um, thanks again for sharing your story. Really appreciate it. Um, the question that I have is, um, how do you or can you prepare for the unexpected? And if you do, how do you tactically approach that scenario when it pops up each and every day? Or in a race, you know, how, how do you prepare for the unexpected? Um, I'm speaking to you at 69. I didn't have this in my 30s because I wasn't taught. I didn't, I was a survivor. Whatever happens, happens. You just sort of roll with it. There's teaching out there today in mindfulness on emotional maturity and being able at any moment to take control of your mind and think the thoughts that you want to think versus the thoughts that are in your brain. Many of the thoughts that are in my brain are not my thoughts. They have come from other people. I've heard them and they've lodged and taken root in my brain. And all of a sudden I'm thinking other people's thoughts versus the thoughts that I have wanted to have in my brain. And again, don't wanna to be too anal here, but stuff happens. You know, I think the bumper sticker said, said shit happens, you know, stuff happens. And if you're not prepared mentally to have the unexpected come, you'll be overwhelmed. Like this, you know, two months ago, I'm putting on my running shoes and I open my car door <laughs> and this concrete truck comes by and the guy's texting and the concrete truck, truck comes close and rips off my door, comes four inches from my head. You know, oh, there was my door and I, whoa, that guy, guy that took off my head. And I remember thinking, I have a couple responses here. I can get really pissed. <laughs> what the F, you know, what do you, other one is breathe. What do you want to do? <laughs> I remember just kicking in that girl going, I don't want to want to do, I'm going to run down the street and chase after that guy. And so I did, you know, and had this big thing with the police and stuff. Um, when my daughter, you know, we, you know, she's doing gymnastics at nine years old and she does a backflip into the, the foam pit. She breaks her arm off in half. <laughs> and she stands up and her, her arms hanging, you know, and she goes, hey, dad. And I go, and all the parents go, ah, <laughs> well, look at that girl, there's blood, you know, it's broken off. And I go, I'll be right, I walk softly there. I had practiced in military, in sports, not losing control. But somebody has to be in control. You know, the president of the United States should be the guy that we look to and say, make good decisions now. You know, the father or whoever the parent is, don't worry about it. It'll, we'll work it out. I think we've had you know, like five broken arms, and three broken legs in my family, <laughs> you know, from football and lacrosse and snowboarding and this and that. Um, I lost my house um, in the recession. I built a house for 2.5 million. And it went on the market for 700,000 and I lost everything. And it was one of those moments where you say, what are you gonna do? Unexpected happens, um, breathe, breathe. Take the panic and the anxiety and put it in the right place. Now, if ever you need to think smart, think smart, regroup. And so your question is, what do you do with the unexpected? It, it's going to happen. Uh, six months ago, a girl rear-ended me while she was texting. Um, I thought, I'm on a way to a meeting, and I got to speak. And I'm stuck in the middle of a highway with this car stuck under my car. And I thought, what the hell? Okay, you'll get through this. It's not the end of the world. Be nice to this girl. She's freaking out. She's going to get killed by her parents. She's stupid at 16 texting, you know, do I want to crush her? Or, or do I want to encourage her, you know, breathe, take control. And you just have to practice every day. How do I want to be in control of my mind today? And I want to make my mind a priority that I want to think the way I want to think, not the way my emotions will want me to think when that thing happens to me. And it's going to happen. I mean, if there's anything I can tell you as a grandparent, and you all know this, stuff happens. And you have a choice on how you respond to your wife, your husband, 
how you respond to your kids, your next door neighbor, the guy that hits you in the car, you know, you get a heart attack. How do I want to respond? It's either a negative experience. What the F, you know, or here's a positive experience. I guess this could be an adventure. Never really wanted one of these, but this is going to be sort of fun. You know, let's, let's find a way to, I went and took a shower and shaved and said, it's a great day to have a heart attack. Let's go to the hospital. <laughs> you know, just, I'm not going to, my wife's going, you're going to die. You're going to die. Don't do that. Don't talk about it. You know, this is going to be a fun experience. Never had one of these before. Let's, let's go ride this thing. You know, let's see what happens. And you have a choice, but it takes everyday practice. I'll close with this. One of the techniques we learn is every morning when you wake up, the first thing you do is roll out of bed in the dark, put your feet on the ground, put your hands on your knees. And when you get in this position, you're signaling to your brain, I'm going into a state. I'm, I'm, this is a purposeful thing. And then I breathe. And during that time, I take control of all those thoughts in my brain and say, I'm not going to think any of those thoughts. I'm tired. I'm bummed. I got pressure today. I got bills. I'm going to think my thoughts. It's going to be a great day. I like to stay. I'm going to be okay today. It's my thing. And I, I take control of my mind so that my first thoughts are my thoughts versus the other thoughts, bills, babies, issues. And if you get extreme on that, you do that in the morning, you do that at lunch, you take five minutes off at lunch, you go sit someplace and breathe, reboot, recalibrate, and you do it before you go to bed at night. This is what I did good today, I didn't do good today. Hard to do if you had too many glasses of wine, but you know, if, you're, if you just think, and then you, you work on taking control of your mind as a lifestyle so that when stuff happens, you're prepared. And I wish I'd known this in my 30s. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, in respect to everyone's time, um, I don't want to keep Robert any longer, uh, but this has been unbelievable. Um, you are one of a kind, my friend, and we are super blessed to have spent the last hour uh, hearing from you and uh, just want to thank you uh, for for sharing all that information with us, Un unbelievable. Um, and now you guys, yeah, let, me, let me just say thank you to you and to all of you watching. Um, I encourage you. Your best days are ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, your best days are ahead. But our decisions determine our destiny. And you can work on your decisions if you can think right. Mm -hmm. And the practice is, I want to think my best self. I want to be the best version of me today. And that's going to take work in my mind gym as well as my physical gym. And we teach guys in the special ops, it's 80% mental. Most people think special ops is, you know, 80%, 90% physical, but it's really not. It's the mental game of staying in the game and thinking right when the bullets are flying and stuff's happening, people are dying, there's blood spurting everywhere. Breathe, stay in your training. But if you haven't trained, you'll go back into whatever is natural. And that's why all of you are going to do wonderful as you continue to work on thinking better, not just positive, but, but with mental control, mental strength, mental resiliency. Scott, can I show one last little thing? A hundred percent. I'm on a phone call every month with Naval Strategic Warfare, and that's Coronado. That's a Navy SEAL base. And there's a bunch of us who um, we talk about how do we raise more mature 18 year olds, emotionally mature 18 year olds, because they're gonna be in pressure 18 to 30 in the special ops community. How, is we, how do we as instructors help these kids to mature and develop faster than they would normally do that? And one of the things that was talked about recently was so interesting, he just said, most of you think the opposite of strength is weakness, but the opposite of strength is not weakness. The opposite of strength is fragility, being fragile, being frail. And the definition of fragility is easily broken. It's unable to be knocked around. 
And he said, we have great people with smarts. We have guys in the SEAL community, the Air Force Ranger community, all smart guys. But have they practiced being knocked around? And it's our job to knock them around to see if they break, if they're fragile mentally. And so it isn't that they're weak, it's they can't handle the unexpected, the knocking around, the, the no eating for this or no sleeping for this or things happening out of their control. <clears throat> Can they still think when they're out of control? Are they frail? And we have six weeks or eight weeks to knock these young kids around to either eliminate them or to train them how to not be fragile anymore. All of us are fragile. We're all fragile. But if you don't practice being knocked around, <clears throat> when you get knocked around, you'll get knocked around. <laughs> you get hit by a car, or your kid does something. If you're, not, if you're not used to being knocked around as a parent or as a business owner or with budgets and, and financial issues, if you're not used to being knocked around and finding a way to win, land on your feet, you'll get knocked around. And our job as leaders is to say, I can be knocked around and it won't break me. And that takes practice in business and family and career and entrepreneurship because all there is, is change, the unexpected. And that's the game in life is, can you handle being knocked around? Are you fragile emotionally, mentally, relationally, socially, physically, financially? Are you frail and easily broken? And you do stupid things when you get broken because you, you didn't practice for that moment. That's a thought. Love it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Unbelievable. Um, thank you again. Uh, I, I don't have any words. Uh, you're a special, special person. And I am uh, incredibly grateful to have you in my life. Uh, and for all of you who want more, uh, pick up Beyond Average uh, and pick up Standing O Salute tomorrow. Uh, and you can read more from Robert. But Robert, thank you again. Appreciate it. If any of you want to contact me, feel free to email me and say hi, and I'll, I'll communicate with you. And, and the book came out on audio too. So you, you can now get the book. I narrated the book, and it's more fun than the written book because I, I'm laughing half the time telling the, the stupid stories in the book. Thank Phenomenal. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Bye-bye. Thank you.